Hi students, welcome back to the chapter 16 lecture. Um, I'm probably going to be able to finish up this chapter in this next segment. Okay, so I was talking about gymnosperms. Gymnosperms represent this third major adaptive radiation of plant life. And they can complete their life cycles on dry land and withstand long, harsh winters. The descendants of early gymnosperms include the conifers, otherwise known as the cone-bearing plants, which include pine trees, fir trees, cedars, junipers, and other groups. This picture primarily shows Douglas fir trees, um, which are the second tallest tree after redwoods. A ponderosa pine tree is the sporophyte and produces two types of cones containing the gametophytes. So unlike the bryophytes, which have a gametophyte as the dominant life form, trees themselves are the sporophytes. Their cones, which they produce two different types of here, the most obvious type um, pine cone here, contains the gametophytes. So the cones that you are all familiar with as being called pine cones are the ovule producing cones. So the scales of these pine cones produce the female gametophytes. And these smaller cones here are the pollen producing cones that produce the male gametophytes. Angiosperms are the flowering plants, and they evolved about 140 million years ago. They have complex reproductive structures called flowers that bear seeds within protective chambers known as ovaries. Angiosperms are the great majority of living plants, so most plants that you see on a daily basis are angiosperms. They are represented by more than a quarter of a million species, and include fruit and vegetable crops, grains and other grasses, and most trees. Fruit is a ripened ovary that helps protect the seed and increases seed dispersal. If you've ever eaten blackberry jam, you're well aware that there are lots of seeds in blackberries. Um, and the fact that the seeds are contained within this delicious fruit is actually a very important adaptation for flowering plants. Um, without fruit that is eaten and dispersed by animals, plants would be much less successful. And if you don't directly eat fruit that contains seeds, you may be familiar with what can occur if you hike through an area with a lot of plants that have gone to seed, um, especially grasses, um, foxtails in particular in the west, which are sharp um, protective coatings over seeds, and many other types of seeds can easily get lodged in fabric, within shoes, um, within the fur coat of animals, including domestic dogs, cats, cows, etc. So seeds are really designed to be dispersed. Plants are wanting to spread their genetic material and they have evolved many different ways of doing that. So some plants disperse their seeds by wind, like with dandelions, um, some plants disperse their seeds via animal ingestion, and some disperse their seeds via animal transportation. Gymnosperms are responsible for supplying most of our lumber and paper. So all of those fir trees, pine trees, um, juniper trees, etc., any of those coniferous trees can be used for firewood, they can be used for building material, they can be used for manufacturing paper. Angiosperms provide nearly all of our food, as well as fiber, medications, perfumes, and decoration. Uh, so plants are 
kind of underappreciated in the public sphere. So unless you're a botanist or really into studying plants, chances are you don't pay them much attention. They're just part of the landscape and we take them for granted. But plants are an incredibly important part of the ecosystem. And like I said earlier, for most food webs, plants are ultimately at the base of that food web. Okay, as a recap, there are four major categories of plants that represent four distinct periods of evolutionary change. We have the bryophytes, which are those non-vascular plants, mosses, liverworts, and hornworts. They typically grow in moist areas because they cannot um, reproduce readily without water transporting um, their genetic material. And they do not have the specialized vascular tissue of all the other plants, which is a major limitation in how, um, how much they can grow and how far away they can get from the surface they're growing on. Ferns do have that vascular tissue. They can be a lot bigger, but they do not have seeds. Gymnosperms, the conifers, they have seeds that are less advanced and less protected than those of angiosperms, but they do have vascular tissue and they can reach enormous heights. And then angiosperms, all of the flowering plants, most of the plants that we're familiar with, including grasses, are angiosperms. Okay, moving on to fungi. Fungi are not plants. Fungi are completely separate organisms, but they're also eukaryotes. So like plants, they do have a true membrane-bound nucleus. They have organelles. They're typically multicellular. Interestingly, they're more closely related to animals than they are to plants, and they arose from a common ancestor about 1.5 billion years ago. These are a few examples of fungi. We have a lot of shelf fungus and fungus that grows out of um, dead and dying trees. Some species um, will typically grow in rings that are known as fairy rings. Yeast is also actually a fungus. So the yeast that we use to bake bread and um, brew beer is a fungus. It's a tiny, um, unicellular fungus that is capable of asexual reproduction. We have a few predatory fungal species. Here we see a roundworm being attacked by a predatory fungus. And then mold, of course, is also technically a fungus. Fungi and bacteria are the principal decomposers within ecosystems. So they are essential for keeping ecosystems stocked with the inorganic nutrients that are necessary for plant growth. So when living things such as plants and animals um, incorporate inorganic nutrients and basically turn those nutrients into organic forms, without fungus and bacteria, those nutrients would be trapped in those tissues. It wouldn't be a cycle, it would be a flow of um, nutrients. So fungus and bacteria are actually really essential for returning um, those nutrients to the soil and making it available for living plants and animals. Without decomposers, elements such as carbon and nitrogen would accumulate in non-living organic matter. And plants and animals, they feed excuse me, would end up starving because the elements that are taken from the soil would not be returned. So again, fungus, as well as bacteria, generally overlooked. Some people even think they're gross, um, but they are really important parts of our ecosystems. And then we also have some major medical advances from um, molds, which are also technically um, a fungus. So we have penicillin here. 
which is the first antibiotic that was discovered is actually produced by a mold known as penicillium. So this is a cluster of penicillium cells and this streak here is staphylococcus. So this staphylococcus um, bacteria actually causes staph infections and penicillium will naturally inhibit the growth of staphylococcus. So in microbiology classes this would be a typical um, experiment that you would do. You would streak this nutrient agar plate with um, a culture of staphylococcus and then either put a antibiotic disc or a culture of penicillium on that agar plate and you'll see what happens. So after a few days that staphylococcus grows, the cells become visible in this streak and then you'll see this zone of inhibited growth or zone of inhibition. This basically just shows that the penicillium mold actually deters or inhibits the staphylococcus from growing. Okay, so with this last slide here, we're going to conclude chapter 16. Um, I just wanted to add that lichen is a symbiotic association between unicellular algae and photosynthetic bacteria or fungi. And sometimes lichen are mistaken for mosses. Um, all of these light green, sort of seafoam green hanging clusters um, that are attached to these conifer tree branches are actually lichens and not mosses. And then here you'll see um, small groups of lichen that are growing on this old um, shed deer antler. Okay, so that is the conclusion of chapter 16. Again, any material that I cover from here on out will not be on the final exam. So just focus on what I have covered thus far. There will be homework um, next week over chapter 17 and 18. And I will be posting a study guide for the final exam on Blackboard as well. Um, good luck and thank you for listening as always. If you have any questions, feel free to email me.